Oh, yeah, that, it's great, man. I'm glad you're not showing the video since I'm all naked here and I've got the camera aimed at my crotch. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to the Kodakara Podcast. This week we have a very special guest, Nuke Marine. To give a short background behind who he is, Nuke Marine is a 45-year-old retired military veteran living in Yokosuka, and he's lived in Japan for over 15 years now. And nowadays he spends a lot of time in online communities, not only as a member, but as a moderator, utilizing a lot of his leadership skills that he developed while he was in the military. And he also provides a lot of resources for the community for free. And uh, recently, he also works part-time as an English teacher and has his own YouTube channel where you can follow his Japanese language learning journey as well as his different ideas for learning Japanese. Today, we're hoping to get to know a little bit more about who the man is behind his online presence. So we talk about his time in the military, how he met his Japanese wife, what he's learned from managing these online communities, and his ambitions for the future. If you like the podcast, please like and subscribe as it would really help the YouTube algorithm. And if you want to personally support the podcast, we do have a Patreon with some goals like including a video portion of the podcast. But right now, we'd like to thank our current Patreons, um, Jack, Miku, Salt Shaker, and Azanga71. So I hope you guys enjoy the podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Kodakata Podcast, where we talk about different aspects of Japan with people who know what they're talking about. I'm Raza, and I'm joined by my co-host, Eric. And this week, we have a very special treat in our guest, Nuke Marine. Yeah, so I first saw Nuke Marine's screen name when I first started learning Japanese. And I would always see his name because he's really active in all these um, Japanese learning communities and some other communities as well. But... It always seemed like he has a lot of stories and seemed like a really interesting guy from his screen name as well. So always wanted to talk to him. So I really appreciate you being here. But Nick, can you give us a little quick background behind who you are and where you're at today? Uh, yeah, so I'm a 45-year-old guy uh, living in Japan. About 15 or so years ago, I got transferred to Japan when I was in the U.S. Navy. And then when I, that's when I kind of kind of got started into the uh, Japanese learning uh, it for real, as opposed to like, you know, one time in while I was uh, in the Marine Corps, I did uh, like a semester of Japanese while I was stationed in Okinawa, which went nowhere because I, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I started, I seriously got into the kanji kohi or the, the community based on the RTK, remembering the kanji by James Hazy. got into that. And during that time, it was just a weird, it was actually a fortunate time where a lot of people, like a lot of programmers were developing stuff to help make the learning of the language more efficient for those that aren't doing the traditional route, which is going to a, um, either going going to Japan and learning it that way, or going to a language school, or taking a classes in college. In other words, the self study realm. So it's around that time again that Ajax was coming about, and uh, Anki was being developed by Damian Mounds and a number of other things as well. The uh, but anyway, that, so I got involved with the community, was trying to get serious about learning Japanese. I think I was doing a pretty good pace, even though I was active duty in the military at the time, and so this was like a hobby. Not uh, I couldn't dedicate like my full time to it. Just dedicating my free time to it. Um, then about three years, oddly enough, like I was really serious when I was stationed in Africa, <laughs> Djibouti, Djibouti, Africa. And, um, cause I got a lot of free time there cause I couldn't like travel mm-hmm. around. It was basically in a war zone, <laughs> not a war zone, sorry, combat zone. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, but anyway, did that. Then when, oddly enough, when I came back to Japan and I was again, still in the Navy, I actually got out of learning Japanese. Um, I was dedicating more of my time really to, you know, my job and whatnot and some other things as well. Um, Jen, a few years, few years back after I retired and even during that time, I was like, I still had all the resources. So I would, I would still be kind of keeping a, a finger in the community, a, a foot in the community. Just if somebody asked or needed something, I can give them the links to it or give what advice I had at the time, but I wasn't really learning. And then, uh, yeah, but after I retired a couple of years after that, I, was actually trying to learn Spanish. And then I, in a roundabout way, got me back to learning Japanese because I was thinking I wanted to put all this material I had for Anki and give it to Memorize, which then got me into wanting to get better at it. Then I realized how, you know, Memorize started being a more trouble than it was worth. And I went back in Anki and also got in contact with Matt's community mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. when he was doing uh, Matt versus Japan. And then it became MIA. And then, yeah, this also in that time, you know, kind of developed a, a Patreon not necessarily raise funds to just that someone suggested he, they wanted to just show their support or show their appreciation. So that's when I started that up. And then I also thought it was a nice way I could share material, specific material that people would actually care about instead of just like throwing it out there and let any random person 
just a collective, like just for those that actually are interested in it. Um, yeah, that was kind of like a random intro, but yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it's kind of funny, like even during that time, I was like even teaching English for, um, you know, at a small English school uh, after I had retired. So, you know, there's that as well, but that's not really related to learning Japanese. It looks like you're doing everything out here. <laughs> random, random, <laughs> random stuff. Like even the, even the whole videos came when I was on, you know, on base. I wanted to volunteer at the community center to teach people in a classroom, like here on a Katakana. Mm-hmm. But when I kept repeating the class over and over, it just made obvious sense that, um, oh, let's just put this on video. That's when I started putting those videos on the YouTube channel, which, so that's one of the more viewed videos was the, um, let's learn hiragana or I'm sorry, um, remembering the hiragana, remembering the katakana videos. And then later on also, that's when I started making the remember the kanji videos. So I did like 70 hours of videos for teaching for, for 1100 kanji. Oh, wow. So, yeah. They're, <laughs> yeah. So it's all random stuff. It's nothing really structured here. Just, all right. So let's start a little bit from the beginning with your journey with Japan. Okay. God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> oh, not that far back. Okay. <laughs> a little further ahead. Okay. Let's get forward out. Some stuff happened. Then Nuke went to, Nuke Marine went to, I'm sure. I shouldn't say Nuke went to Japan. I, I went to Japan. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I want to ask like, uh, so how long have you been in Japan as of now? Uh, again, one year while I was stationed there in the Marine Corps in Okinawa, then, and 19, I'm um, December of 199, I'm sorry, 2006. So when I was officially stationed there in the Marine Corps, I left for about a year and a half to Africa and then came back and it's pretty much been there since. So I guess all in total, I mean, if you really want to add it all up about 13 to 15 years, you know, I haven't thought about it too much, but I see. <laughs> and also the time that you did go to Japan, I'm sure that the internet wasn't as prevalent as it is today where you can easily see like vlogs or YouTube videos as to what Japan is like. So do you still remember the sort of cultural shock that you might have experienced when you first arrived in the country? Well, I mean, because there was still, I mean, it's kind of weird. It wasn't really a cultural shock because I went to, when I was in the Marine Corps again, it was just like, you're going to bases. So you're more like you're still in this bubble of the U.S. And so you're just slowly um, exposed to Japanese culture once you leave the base. So it's like, um, it's always a controlled cultural shock. And then similar with um, when I, joined the Navy and then later on got stationed in Japan. But, it, you know, um, I'm not really, it takes very a lot to, it doesn't take a lot. I'm not surprised by much. So I'm not really culture shocked. I, I do appreciate, I was like, really thought a lot of stuff was cool. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you know, the, the food was amazing. The structure was amazing. The kindness was amazing. I mean, people, a random stranger will help like walk you, yeah. take 30 minutes out of their time to help you get where you need to go. You know, that's just not a common thing in the U.S., you know, um, even in where I'm from in Texas, you know, where, again, the friendship state. And, you know, you, you do show some kindness to strangers, but it's like in Japan, it was like a whole other level from what I, from what I noticed. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, um, I, yeah, so I enjoy li- living here. I definitely enjoy living here. I see. So uh, you mentioned a little bit about what kind of got you into Japan, what you liked. And I guess for all the viewers, everyone has kind of associated you as kind of just been in Japan, like into Japan from the start. But were there any other factors that kind of got you to really want to come back to Japan from just being into the Marine Corps for a year? Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed my time in Japan, the Marine Corps. So I said the benefit in the at the Navy at the time, you could select orders like locations. So I one of my top five choices. So I made sure to have Japan was one of the top choices. Uh, so it was that, and it was, it was fortunate. Also, went happened to go to a ship called the the Blue Ridge, which, if you want to look at, it, it was kind of like a floating embassy. So the purpose of the Blue Ridge is essentially the three star admiral, which is the admiral of the whole fleet, and they travel around to all the countries, and that's where they get all the big ways come on and have this big party, and this essentially do what happens at embassies, mm-hmm. but it goes places. Um, so, it, but also meant that I got a lot of time when in because it didn't really travel all that much oh. when it did was for a short time. So it was in Japan a lot. So I got to then, even though it was on ship go out and experience ja- um, Japan a lot more. I see. And what were some of those favorite places that you did explore while you were in Japan? Let's say, well, obviously restaurants, just, just walking around town was cool. Yeah, definitely. And it just that I could take a, let's say a cultural tour. So you had to go to this house where they're teaching, you know, uh, sh- uh, Shodo or, you know, calligraphy mm-hmm. or, you know, the culture there, you go to the sumo tournament because, you know, the tickets would be cheaper 
go to even even going to Disneyland, which is kind of a cultural experience because like Tokyo Sea or Tokyo Disneyland and Tokyo or Disney Sea are just kind of a unique experience yeah. you should have in Japan, which is different than in a, especially Tokyo Sea. Mm -hmm. I think Sea is the one that's exclusive to Japan, right? Right. Uh, and just how they, they do it compared to the other areas of the world. Um, you know, if you, I know it's kind of cheesy, you know, the, the convenience stores are obviously cheesy to say, but again, it's a unique experience compared. I wouldn't even say unique. Obviously you go to Taiwan and you see like very similar things. Yeah. You appreciate what they're doing in Japan. They very similar things are in the, in Taiwan as well. So I, I like that. I see. Uh, did you ever get to visit one of those like anime spots in Japan? I, I wasn't, I'm not like an anime geek. Mm. So I wasn't too into anime. I enjoy, I enjoy good anime, but I'm not like, it's all about the anime. So I never went, did like this tour to the Ghibli Museum. Never did that. Um, or I didn't really care about this one particular area that there may have been a, a, a scene happen. Oddly enough, I will say this though. There was a game system called the Sega Dreamcast. And on the Sega Dreamcast was a game called Shin Yu. And Shin Yu was the first game was based in Yokosuka or, and if you, I remember the first time I came to Yokosuka, but it was on, a, uh, my ship was going on a deployment and got it here for two weeks and just walking down the street and seeing like the, the area of the video games that were popping up in this town. So that was kind of cool. And that video game was a, I think it was a pretty good video in, in trying to relay what a little brief glimpse of what Japanese culture would be like, you know, like mm -hmm. again, the, uh, the squat toilets, the, the way homes are laid out, the it's sort of like, People are kind of like private. They don't really want to be bothered. You don't want to bother everybody yeah. when you're going about your, your thing, get, you know, let people do their own thing, but they're still doing their own thing. Um, it was just, you know, the little convenience stores, the captchas, the, the little game tokens, uh -huh. you know, just all this kind of cool stuff that is, you, you just notice it's about Japanese. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, don't do the cultural stuff like how to make a sword or how to wear a kimono. <laughs> yeah. I never did any of that stuff. I never, um, yeah, so I guess I'm kind of boring that way. I just I enjoyed what the society was like. How's that? Not maybe maybe not necessarily the culture, but the society. Mm -hmm. There you go. Did you ever get a chance to visit some of the nearby Asian countries? Because I know earlier you mentioned Taiwan, and mm -hmm. for me personally, I grew up in Taiwan for a number of years, and there's a lot of similarities between Japan, and Taiwan, such as like konbinis and the Shinkansen, but then at the same time, there's still a lot of like cultural differences. So I wanted to ask like what. What, what was your experience like traveling around different countries right. in, um, in Asia? It was just surprising because, you know, I've been to, you know, I've gone to Hong Kong. I've gone to, I never went to mainland China, but, you know, Hong Kong was an experience, but that was, you know, 15 years ago, unfortunately, and I'm sure a lot has changed now. Um, I was just impressed with how close, you know, what, what I was, my visual, what China would be like, whereas obviously Taiwan is a different version of China. Um, since obviously it's, a, you know, a bit more of a commercial as opposed to, yeah, communist layout. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's yeah. not get into politics. <laughs> um, but I, it, you can definitely tell that they use stuff from Japan to help develop their own. Yeah. You know, again, they mm -hmm. you know ship the trains over, and so you do. If you ride a bullet train, it would be a bullet train that was built and used in Japan. Mm -hmm. Would you say that traveling to these different countries in Asia mm -hmm. gave you a deeper understanding of Japanese culture or even appreciation? I'm, I'm not trying to say I'm like. Um, enlightened in the way of Jap in the way of Japan. I'm not, um, just that I, there's stuff I appreciate and that's about it. I'm not trying to sell it. It's just that I found it enjoyable. So, mm -hmm. and, and let's just face it. The toilets are amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm stationed in Japan and the, on the military base, he used American toilets. And it's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> How could they do that to you? <laughs> yeah. Plus, the architecture on base is horrible. It's like this, it's like bricks, you know, they're painted white over and just oh, horrible. Yeah, we actually ended up doing an entire podcast on toilets, like, ironically, but just because. The, Sitting on toilets or about toilets? Toilet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were saying how good the user experience is in Japan for <laughs> the toilets. Random flush. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they, they got all the features installed there. Yeah, but, um, Previously, you mentioned, I guess, like how video games gave you a snapshot as to what Japanese culture could be. And one thing... Just that one video oh, game. No, just, just that, that one, one video game. 
<laughs> for that. Yeah, yeah. That's the important part. Let's say Donkey Kong is not a good representation <laughs> of Japanese, <laughs> Japanese construction. I mean, it's not. Okay. That, is, that is very true. But yeah, mentioned, going back to on that snapshot, though, there's one thing that you have had with Japan is longevity living there. Mm-hmm. So one thing I would I want to know is how has Japan changed from when you first came over there mm-hmm. to now? Is there has there been anything drastic or something that really sticks out in your mind? The internet got better, you know, as as you would. Um, probably the number of TV channels has increased, as you would expect. Um, it was just it's the fact that how much doesn't change. I mean, they still, as they say, you know, you hear it like they still use faxes, they still use those hunk the stamps um, to for signatures. Um, Japan is kind of kind of resistant to change, you know. And if it, if there is change, they kind of hide yeah. it. So you, you might not notice it. Uh, oh, I will say though, I think though, you know, Chinese tourism has been on the increase. There is that tourism in general, especially, I, I guess I heard like Kyoto, like there's just going to have more people just showing up to look at stuff. So there is that. Um, obviously this year it's gonna, it went down, but that was a thing that's been changed. Just the, the, the amount of travel from other countries to Japan. Mm-hmm. And the, so I guess outside of Japan is just the interest in Japanese culture is always is getting, always getting higher and higher and higher. Yeah. And like one of the biggest trends is of this past decade has to be anime. So have you seen, I guess, any, um, anything in Japan specifically in terms of tourism, mainly coming from anime? Only on TV. Like they'll say, uh, you and I should you go on the, oh, you're like, why did you come to Japan? Uh-huh. So you see it on there, you kind of like cringe, you kind of cringe at what there is like. Cause they think like Japan's all about anime. It's not like anime is like, yeah, it's on TV, but a majority of TV is either really the sketch shows, oh, yeah. the, you know, the talk shows. And then after that, it's drama. And then after, maybe after that, it's anime. So anime is like not even t- not top tier. It means popular. You got kids that, you know, I mean, I mean, the arcades are still there. So kids go to the arcades. There's that. But as far as anime, um, I mean, I, I mean, there was a Shingeki no um, Kyojin got big. Mm-hmm. So you saw that everywhere. Um, you know, there, Harry Potter is still big, although that's not anime, but you know, you start seeing that places, uh, especially because the theme park opened in Tokyo that used to be in Osaka or that was in Osaka. So the, the Harry Potter theme park, the, um, I think what was recent. I don't know. I mean, I don't see too much anime. I think lately, uh, Demon Slayer is pretty popular, like Kimetsu no Yaiba. I only hear that like on, I, I mean, if it is, I mean, I've never watched it yet. I've always seen people mention it, but, but that's online, not in Japan. Um, but again, it's like, I'm a 45 year old guy. My wife's 50 and our friends are in that ra- age range as well. So, <laughs> um, I might have one friend cause I was, when I was doing a let's read of Neon Genesis Evangelion, not a really good anime in my opinion, but apparently super popular though. One of my friends was really into that anime. And then I may have been watching, um, the other anime I've been watching, like, so definitely Attack on Titan, One Punch Man. Those are the only two anime I really have watched. I did do Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood recently, and it turned out to, it's actually a good anime. I was surprised. Um, I watched it way back when with English, with English subtitles, but that was the first one, not the remake. Um, Death Note, I wasn't, a, wasn't impressed. It was okay. It was good, hmm. but I mean, I, but again, I'm not, I was never really that much into anime. If it was a good anime, so right. I think Attack on Titan is an amazing anime. Really good manga. One Punch Man is really funny, so I like it. But um, uh, Goblin Slayer turned out to be pretty good. <laughs> very violent, but very good. Uh, but I'm just not watching too much anime. So, and I'm not noticing it, you know, outside of people who are fans of it. So, yeah, obviously it's there. It's in the culture. You, you walk in the store, you might see the figurines of a particular anime. I don't know who it is. It just it's, it's a female. An- it's a female figure. <laughs> The purple hair, blue swimsuit. I, you know, may, apparently they know exactly who that is. So it's like, <laughs> Which is funny because I'm big into Marvel. Oh yeah, but I'm not a, like a super geek about it. I'm not wearing a Marvel T-shirt or anything. Um, mm-hmm. I, maybe anime is obviously big. I mean, it's got to be big. You mm-hmm. look at it, but it just from what I've noticed, the biggest thing on TV, the cultural thing, are those stupid talk shows where they're either doing skits or. They're just talking in about some, some event of the day and, or again, dramas. Right. So I do watch a lot of Japanese dramas and I do notice the dramas impact on Japanese culture. So Galileo, you'll see them, you know, comedians going, you know, make fun of that show or 
now it's Hanzo Naoki, so they'll say like um she ye death or some other signature. <laughs> <laughs> so, but <laughs> oh my no make <laughs> just it's like because if you watch the drama, a, a few of the actors are traditional kabuki actors, and they're bringing that kind of style, and it's just completely hilarious. <laughs> Even though it's trying to be the serious drama, you just can't take it seriously because they're all screaming at their top of the lungs, like you know their very life is on the line. Um, you know, really got off track there, but yeah, yeah, the big cultural thing is dramas, not anime, in my opinion. I could be wrong. And would you say that your favorite type of Japanese media would be Japanese dramas? Yes, mainly because I used that as a form of study, and then it turned out I actually enjoyed it. So there was that. I see. Um, starting to just get into reading books, but books to audiobooks. So I'll read along with the audiobook, mm-hmm. and um, that's kind of fun. And I'm, and definitely the writing because I was like reading the books uh, more grounded in reality. Drama they really over dramatic dramatized. <laughs> <stuff. laughs> Seriously, they like the oh, the situations are just unbelievable. <laughs> Right. You'll see like 20 people all surrounded, all looking at this one person on a computer and they're all like, he does something. He's like, yeah, everyone cheers. It's like, no, it's not happening in reality. You know, like, these two people having this big argument while everyone just like looking around, looking all serious, but not doing anything else other than looking at these two people yelling at each other. Again, not happening. But in the books, it feels like they take it more seriously. Like this is much, much, much more grounded. So I thought it was, it felt more enjoyable once I got into it. Obviously reading a Japanese book, is uh, an endeavor the first time you try it. So, but it, once you get into it, it's actually quite fun. Right, I guess now, kind of shifting towards your motivation for staying in Japan. So you mentioned that you were in Japan for a year, then went to Africa, and then came back to Japan. Mm-hmm. But that's all military related. And by the time I left to Africa, I'd already been married. Okay. So getting back to Japan, it's a little easier in the military if you happen to have a spouse that's in that area. They'll they save money. They would prefer to transfer you there. It's not necessarily the case, but usually. Uh, so I got the benefit to be able to go back to Japan. So there was that. While it was my last station, I was able to purchase an apartment or so purchase, I had to yeah, buy an apartment while I was in the Navy. So that allowed me to stay a lot easier mm-hmm. once I got out. I see. Was it hard to buy an apartment at that time compared to renting? The military actually pays a lot of money, <laughs> a lot of money for rent, right? But since I bought the apartment, I got, instead of me paying that rent to somebody else, that went to the mortgage. So I got to be able to do that. So it's one of the rare, it's a very rare situation because one of the things about being in the military in Japan, you can't really get a loan from Japanese banks because they assume you're just going to be leaving the country and how are they going to find you? So they don't give you a loan. So it's very hard for active duty military to get a, but because my wife wasn't, was working, I actually got the loan through her. So that's how we got to where we get the apartment. And that also made staying a lot easier. So we didn't have to move or find a different apartment that was cheaper in rent. Cause you know, again, I'm saying rent here. We're talking, imagine paying up to almost $2,000 a month in rent. That's what the military pays. Technically the, it, now we're getting some weird shit. Here, sorry. <laughs> um, it, it might actually be the Japanese government is paying that rent that goes back to the owners of land of houses in the area of that the bases are located. So it's kind of a weird <clears throat> arrangement, um, but that's rental. But because of the, but if you look at it, like actually purchasing, very few people do that. So I was very fortunate to have that ability and it just made staying in Japan much easier. Like I wasn't like financially as strapped as somebody else who might have to be paying rent every mm-hmm. month. Mm-hmm. Like they first, they'd have to move because the place they'd be living would be too expensive. So then they have to move to a place that was cheaper and, you know, and then that might affect like what jobs they can get. And, you know, so it's anyway, so there, there you go. <laughs> and I retired. So a pension just means like, okay, you, it's almost as if you got this virtual job where you, you don't have to work, but you get X dollar, X number of dollars an hour. There's that. Um, disability was there. So I got, you know, that increased the amount. So financially I wasn't strapped in. So it allowed me to stay in Japan. My wife worked. So that helped. So it's like, mm-hmm. We're, we could become, we're not struggling to live in Japan. So there's that. Okay. So now you know a little bit more about my personal life. You bastards. <laughs> well, so let's dive a little bit deeper. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned your wife uh, multiple times there. So how exactly did you guys meet? So this was during your first roundabout in Japan. We met at a bar. I'm in the military. We met at a bar. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> no, actually, no, I'll tell you what, let me make it a bit more dramatic. 
at the time I was on my second marriage. All right. But I had, I, we were planning to get divorced. In fact, we we're in the process of getting divorced. We we're in like the fifth month. It takes about six months in California. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that's one of the reasons I was decided to get stationed in Japan was like, you know, okay, well, let's just separate. She moved in with, um, with her grandmother and whatnot. Um, so I'm trying to show I'm not like this bastard, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I was basically here single in Japan, just in the process near the end, about one or two months away from the divorce. Uh, but anyway, since I was here, I was known as what's called a geo bachelor. Now geo bachelor would mean that I have to, I don't get the double debt, but I don't get like, I was getting rent that I was sent to my wife at the time to live in California. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't get rent while to stay in Japan. So I had to stay on the ship. And the ship is like, imagine you're living in a coffin with a curtain. <laughs> that's it. That's your, that's where you sleep. Yeah. So I had to do that for close to quite a few months. Then I found out there was like a nearby kind of like the equivalent of military barracks where I could pay like a very small amount of rent per day. Like we're talking 15 bucks. Oh, well. And I could basically have my own, have my own room. Oh, okay. So I just started doing that. But that was like in Yokosuka called or Yokohama. I'm normally in Yokohama just that. Because this is a military barracks of sorts, you know, there was training going on. So the barracks got filled. I couldn't stay in the room. So I had to come stay the night in Yokosuka. And since I was in Yokosuka, I just thought, okay, I went out for a night to sing karaoke and just happened to be in a bar. And it just happened to be my wife doesn't live in Yokosuka either. She was visiting Yokosuka for a friend's birthday party. Okay. That's when we met. So it's like, if it wasn't like those two things happened, we never went. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that, and it just, we ended up talking. Uh, I left. I was, went to go sing karaoke as the bar I was at would have been half karaoke. I just came back. She just happened to still be there. So we got to talk a little bit more while the bars were closing up. So that was all. And then we arranged for a couple more dates and just kept going from there. All right. So there you <laughs> go. Yeah. Like every true romance in, uh, <laughs> in Yokosuka started in a bar. Okay. Oh, what a chance encounter. What was the whole um, yeah. dating process like back then? Because I- I'm assuming it's a little different than now with, um, I guess you have all these mixers for <laughs> in Japan. Oh, that's called Gokong. Go- yeah. no, that's a that's a Japanese way yeah. of doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it was just a matter of, um, I didn't really date that much in Japan because, again, I was like mainly living on the mm-hmm. ship. Once I was able to get my own place, even then it's kind of difficult because you can't like bring people back to your place. It's on the military base. It, it's a, just a pain in the ass just to get all the clearances. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was that. The dating, I don't know. I mean, it was just a matter of, hey, let's go out. We'll just have a, a, a meal and sometimes we'll go to karaoke, but that was just my thing. So I didn't like go, you know, push they to go always go to karaoke. But I had maybe like four or five dates. At most. So I don't, I'm not really the type of guy that can really say what it's like. I do know about the gold cone. I think they're, they seem silly. <laughs> it looks all kind of cr- almost cringy. It's like, um, you know, you got the three guys on one side and the three ladies on the other side. It's like, Hey, why don't you just switch the middle to, you know, that, kind of, <laughs> that way you're like looking all over, not just looking across. It, you don't feel like you're like, you're, you have to go and pick the one across from you. You know, it's like, it's, uh, it just feels a bit too staged. Um, and, but, you know, if it works, it works. I think it just feels more fun. It's like a chance to chat. But at the same time, also, you don't want to, you know, go with the person you meet at a bar because, you know, you got the people who frequently go to bars yeah. you, you may not want to spend your whole life with. I, I, I could be <laughs> especially if these are bars right near a military base. Uh, <laughs> when you think about, like, Japanese high school, whereas U.S. high school, you always go to, like, different classes. And so you each hour you're being, spending time with different people. Yeah. Whereas in a Japanese school, you're in the same classroom with the same people all mm-hmm. day. And the teacher, different teachers come to your room. Mm. So I think like you probably have a stronger bond with just this small group of people, but you're less likely to be willing to mix in with people outside that group. I could be wrong. I, I'm never, I'm only going on my interpretation. Mm, uh-huh. And most of that probably from drama. So <laughs> that's a bad interpretation. <laughs> So you, you also um, just mentioned that um, when you meet someone in a bar, it's kind of hard to see you um, staying together for the rest <laughs> of your life. So how did you kind of make that judgment when you did meet your wife in a bar initially? Well, again, that's just where the the, uh, the further dates uh-huh. bring about. That's all. Um, so you just develop them from there. But yeah, yeah, date, I think dating should be good. And like, try not to think of the idea like there is that one. So, and I'm, I know this sounds like very rude. It's like, Humans are very complex creatures and we're very adaptable. So you can actually have a long and fruitful and prosperous relationship. And there are probably hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people out there that you could mm-hmm. experience the same thing with. But you know, you just, you do, you do go down to the one, but that's not like you've settled. It's just that they are just as 
Um, they're just as amazing. There's and there's there's unique aspects that you're going to appreciate. So there's that. So I'm just like saying, don't get into the the idea like I'm trying to go away from the idea like, oh, there's that one person in your life. It's so like, from your experience, did you find it difficult being in a relationship with someone outside of your own culture? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing seeing like a, a person who's willing to take care of, you know, actually pay attention to stuff you didn't realize was the, the case, you know. So like, you know, they, they'll actually pay attention to what you're eating and then say like, what's your, and try to make a middle note of what's your favorite food and they'll make that for you, for ex- as an example. Um, you know, just that they will fold your clothes all the time. <laughs> so you got to fold your clothes. They're going to do it for you. Um, that's just the small stuff when you get in a relationship. Now, what really was kind of a cultural shock is let's just go fast forward. If, let's say fast forward, uh, 15 years. And so we're married. Her uncle passed away. So we went to her aunt's place where, and her uncle was still there in the room dead. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause they've already been, he's already prepared. Mm-hmm. So again, I've never been in a situation where you would spend the night as a wake. I've never, in my case, growing up in Texas, there was no such thing as a wake. You just go to the funeral home for an hour or two. There's the body, there's the viewing, and then you leave. So you weren't spending time. Uh, whereas for this, you know, you, there's that part there where it's, there's the body, then the funeral home comes, take the body away. We go to the funeral home and there's the body up there while we're having dinner. And then they take it next door. And then you prepare the body, have it, you know, put all these memorabilia surrounding the body, like pictures, their favorite clothes, the book that they love, the music that they enjoy, and on there. And then the next day we come back, but the close family stayed that night. But, you know, we came back the next day and then they did the funeral ceremony. So there was a cremation. Again, most people, you don't, even if you've been in Japan, you probably haven't gone to a, where a funeral ceremony where, where the cremation is occurring. You know, it's like, so that was an, an experience. And um, yeah, it was just, it was just kind of a shock. But it was like, it, you know, it made sense in that it felt like when we visited our aunt, like last week, and there's the shrine to the, to her, to her husband, and they're talking as if he's still there. Cause in, you know, in, in that culture, he is still there. Mm-hmm. So, and I think it makes the acceptability of death a lot better. The passing was maybe a lot, I mean, emotional, but, I, you know, it felt like it was dealt with better than some of the passings I've seen, like, Maybe in like the U.S. when I went to my mother's funeral, it'd be like, here's three days, buried, forget about it. Like, I, you know, obviously I live in Japan. I can't visit the grave. I don't even know how many people would visit the grave or if it's done. Whereas the shrine to the dead members of the family are there in that in that room in Japan. And I'm sure that's not just Japanese culture. That's like cultures around the world. They're just that it was just something different than the particular culture in the U.S. that I happen to be in. And I'm sure there's areas in the U.S. that were very similar to what you experienced with. Um, what I experienced in Japan because they do have wakes where you do spend all night with the with the body. So you've been with your wife for 15 years alongside your entire relationship with Japan. So has there been any time along these 15 years where you felt like you may have wanted to go back to the U.S.? Not really. Again, I've just I've enjoyed staying in Japan, and I'm from Texas, and the particular area of Texas I'm from. It's actually regress. Anyway, so yeah, I've got no desire to go back to that particular area of Texas for mm-hmm. other than maybe a wedding or a funeral. That's about it. <laughs> and I've lived in California. I wouldn't mind living in California, but yeah, right now the hopefully let, hopefully stuff let stuff settle yeah. right now. I know right now if I travel anywhere on a U.S. visa, I'm not getting back in Japan. So I got to be really careful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they all want to live in Japan as well. So it's, again, it's just a you know, it's it's a it's a it's a advanced society. It's a comfortable society. Um, even if you don't care about the culture, just living here, you can live here and not even know Japanese, and actually probably make it here quite well. Knowing Japanese just makes it a lot easier. You're not like limited to the obvious stuff. You can then kind of go for the less obvious. So yeah. So speaking of Japanese, so when did you actually decide to learn the language when you were over there? Right when I moved to Japan. So that's when I. And okay, so I made the big mistake in that I got the Rosetta Stone, uh-huh. and I wanted to learn. So I was, was trying to act if it, do the uh, kanji side of. It. So you do romaji, hir- kanji, hiragana, katakana. So I did that one, and I was trying to like essentially draw the characters. So like, my, but if you ever seen Rosetta Stone, it's crap. <laughs> okay, so that was a bad mistake. But I was making an effort. But I knew kanji was a was a big part of the solution to learning Japanese. So I was fortunate that I saw this article about remembering the kanji by James Hazig 
And that got me there. So I got the preview, which got me into the first 400 characters of the book. And I made the flashcards. I had this big deck of flashcards and, um, kind of a shade. <laughs> okay. It's kind of shady on my part, but I would actually go out in the, in town and I'd see, you know, sit in a coffee shop and there'd be a nice, uh, you know, attractive Japanese lady there. So I'd actually get her into playing a kanji game with me mm-hmm. and then we end up having a date. With her. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that worked more often that did actually work uh, quite frequently so it's like but yeah it's like show me she showed me the english care english word and i'd write out the kanji and then she went okay so there was that but again i that's how i started and uh hey Chad, if you knew cut some of the time mm-hmm. that's when anki started being developed was by damien elms was mm-hmm. at that you know in like 1990s or i'm sorry <laughs> 2000. <laughs> that's 2000. Good God. Um, it was just kind of weird because a lot of programmers, it was like a lot of computer science, computer programmers were wanting to learn Japanese and using their skills to make tools to help streamline their Japanese learning. It wasn't really about people who become great at Japanese. It was people who were trying to get good in Japanese, making these amazing stuff to help them. Wow. And then that was helping the community. Mm-hmm. I see. And earlier, you briefly mentioned Katsumoto, and I want to ask, like, um, when he first came on the scene, did people immediately take him seriously, or were there people who kind of doubted him? I, most took him seriously. Most took him, like, because there were two, there was the uh, Japanese, there was another Japanese uh, message mm-hmm. board that didn't take him seriously. Some more seriously, I took him seriously. Like, I was messaging him, giving him some ideas as well. I and I, he was, he was really good at giving ideas of how to put Japanese into your life. Mm-hmm. So you were talking to Katsumoto personally? Not only through his website, so by messaging. Like when I first watched my the first drama, all in Japanese, mm-hmm. and I wrote about it and said, yeah, look, yeah, good for you, guy. Yeah, you, you go, guy. You know, that was, you know, kind of s- simple, low-level banter. That was it. Mm-hmm. And on the topic of learning Japanese, I think in the past I read that even though you were in Japan for such a long amount of time, there was a period where you actually quit Japanese. So did something actually happen that made you decide to not learn Japanese anymore during that time? I just got distracted by other things. When I first came back, I, I, want, I was trying to keep up with my studies. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started the volunteer work to teach Hiragana Katakana in Kanji at the community center. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what really changed was the, the earthquake hit in 2011. Right. Now, my station, my command was Naval Area Command and Control Center, really Nuclear Alert Command and Control mm-hmm. Center. So if there was a nuclear incident on the aircraft, every aircraft carrier has this building nearby. In the event of a nuclear incident on the aircraft carrier, I was one to help set up to make sure the connections work. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, the earthquake hit, the great uh, Tokyo earthquake. All of a sudden, I had to do like 12 to 12 plus hour days. I really started concentrating more on my Navy job. Even the spare time I had, I concentrated more on the Navy job. And so that's what happened. Mm-hmm. I kind of dedicated my effort in a different direction. Mm-hmm. So were you still active on the online language learning communities at this time? Yes, yes. So I was, sometimes I'd look and got into Reddit and then I'd hear somebody ask a question. So I'd offer a, I'd post a spreadsheet I had that was like of something that was, mm-hmm. I'd made way back when mm-hmm. um, or Anki decks that I had. So that was all. I see. Yeah, I think it's really cool that you were still active in all these communities, even though you weren't actively studying Japanese. Did mm-hmm. Um, did these sorts of like management of the community and helping everybody ever lead to, um, opportunities that you didn't expect? Uh, well, I mean, I've like one guy, he offered me a job, you know, to work at his startup, mm-hmm. you know, for example, I, I mean, I turned it down, but the, I think it's helped me become a better teacher. Like in the Navy, one of my job prior to moving to Japan was being a teacher. Uh, I taught satellite communication equipment and then that, educational experience, the ability to teach to a, to a group. Mm-hmm. I took, that's the reason why I took that experience. And I, that's probably the reason why I wrote the things down the way I wrote them to make it understood by other people and to get a point across. And then that helped me. And I, then of course I'm a leader in the military. So that meant that I had the ability to lead groups of people in a project. So that's why I could do stuff mm-hmm. online, taking a group of people and, get get a product out there that was workable with others. Mm-hmm. And you probably noticed my personality. I'm a very forceful personality. And I try and I I probably I'm open to take I'm open to any group. So you know if I find myself participating in a group, I want to be I want to participate. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> if you're gonna you see I like, um non-Japanese side of things like CrossFit. 
I was a member, I was an active member of that CrossFit community for exercise and coming up with ideas, discussing stuff or a song of ice and fire or game of Thrones. I was like, so I'm in that subreddit, like talking and giving my ideas and in participating. Um, <laughs> probably uh, other TV shows or other books or whatnot. Just yeah. Virtual reality. Like I dove in there. So like when that was being developed and becoming a reality back in 2013, I was a member of that community, the Oculus community. And even took part in a company for, you know, developing a virtual reality website or virtual reality web browser. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's just, and again, I was just, I, some of this was experience that I gained, but some of it was done because of the experience I had in the Japanese community, Japanese learning community as well. It, hopefully this all makes sense. It's like, it's not a, it's a very big mi- mix, mis- mi- mishmash mm-hmm. of experiences and situations. It just, you know, it just threw dumb luck happened to be there when this stuff started coming about, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then I was willing to take a part in it. And I'm also a guy, if you've seen me, I'm described as a few of my bosses in the military describe me. I'm a guy who can, I might not come up with the right solution, but I do come up with the solution. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as opposed to you, you will probably run into these people that you can even say like, they're always going to come tell you why something won't work. They're, they're going to find a problem with every solution, you <laughs> but they never come up with the solution themselves. Mm-hmm. So um, that's where I, I really, you learn the tricks. Like I tell you what, um, come with me with the solution first and then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> like one, I think one example is like a, let's say a scheduling conflict. This guy wanted Christmas off, but we were a 24 hour, 24 seven operation. So I tell you what you write the schedule and then we'll, and, or get someone to agree with the change or whatnot, then we'll talk. But it's like, it's your job. It's like, no, I already did my job. I made the schedule. So that was, a, that was just one, one way to help out. Like, mm-hmm. um, cause you know, you can't babysit everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess like after managing so many different communities, like the VR chat community and the learn Japanese community, um, what have you found to be the role of a moderator in online? Please. What you want to make sure as a moderator is you're not controlling the community and you're not even making the guy in the community where to go. You just, right now you're playing kind of like referee and mm-hmm. that you should, you should, you should be invisible. All uh, right. Um, except when people are like causing problems in the community, then you step in. So a couple of times that we failed by being a bit too visible, but for the most part, you shouldn't even notice that uh, what we're doing is really there mm-hmm. at all. So how did you actually become the moderator for some of these communities? Like so, learn Japanese was okay for VR chat. That was, <laughs> that was just because the guy who was developing VR chat at the time, um, I forgot his name, but um, I was there when he was like the very first programs he made available for the first Oculus headset. Um, the, so I came up with the idea cause we were developed, we made a subreddit for the, the Janus VR, which was the virtual reality web browser. So I recommended people, Hey, if since you're developing, create your own subreddit. And so I made these subreddits for them and say, Hey, look, Hey, here's a subreddit. So you can, if you wanted to talk development on there, it can work. This is prior to discord becoming popular. So later on discord was a better sit- format for this, but um, at the time Reddit worked out quite well. So that's, but VR chat took off. I just happened to be still remain the owner. of it, so that's why I was the moderator of that one. So that was a pretty big, mm-hmm. that became a big subreddit. And as far as learn Japanese is that since I was always a member of the community, but I was a vocal member of the community, I kind of resisted putting in a request to become a moderator because then that that limited how much I can do for participation. But later on, like, um, Grod really needed help. So that's when I did offer it. And I used my experience from the VR chat subreddit because it was a big subreddit in order to help, you know, the other moderators moderate better. Mm-hmm. You know, like here are the tools you can do. Here are some steps you can take. Um, another guy, he, he brought on some stuff as well to help out. And I actually went through and showed all the other moderators, like here, like on video, here, here are some stuff we can do. So they're not having to learn it themselves. And that just sped stuff. It just sped the process up. And so the community got moderated faster. So all the junk got deleted or hidden. And then that just left, you know, we made a couple of sticky. So we made sure, Hey, all these beginner questions that everybody always asks, instead of it flooding the front page, we want you to still ask it. We still want these beginners to participate. So that's what the sticky thread is for, mm-hmm. you know, or the introduction. So here's the sticky thread. And 
while not everyone participates in the introductions thread, unfortunately, though some do, almost all the questions in the sticky thread for the the, the weekly thread, those almost always get addressed mm-hmm. and answered. So, you know, but the problem is people think that we, we, we hide their posts and say, here, post in the sticky thread that we're punishing them. So you guys, you're not being punished. We're just saying, hey, ask that. There. But they're, they're offended that, the, that we're censoring them. It's like, well, you're literally not being censored. You're, you can still ask. Right. <laughs> so it's, um, so, so that's the, you know, and, and yeah, sometimes, you know, you got to do it in a tactful way. Mm-hmm. Is it a big time commitment to manage all these communities? No, you shouldn't have to. Like, usually you just get a notification, go through it once, once a day, and then yeah, you're done. Mm-hmm. And uh, you got to set up where you got a notification if something major happened. Like, hey, there, this might be someone's put an email address out there. So check it out, make sure it's not harvesting mm-hmm. or, um, or this maybe a hidden link. Most of the time they're false positives, so that's fine. Um, or if it, we've got to set up like there's multiple reports and it's going to be hidden, but we're still going to look at it. Mm-hmm. You know, so we want to make sure like we're not being, th- that was a problem. Like never getting a moderator or notification for every little thing. Mm-hmm. So you just ignored everything. So that's why the moderators weren't doing their jobs when we, before we first came onto it. But mm-hmm. um, that's the district is let, make sure you're noticed, you're notified on the big things. And then once a day, just do a once over. That's, and you, you know what? That's, that's work. That's a manager's work in the real, real world as well. <laughs> you're not, if you're, if you're always taking everything as a emergency, then, um, you're not doing a good job. So, but the, you, you learn that, like get, get notifications. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, make sure everything's addressed, address everything, you know, at least, do a once over. You might make a mistake or whatnot, but at least you've addressed it. It was your eyeballs on the product. And, uh, yeah, it should work out fine. And they're both differently, by the way. VR chat, I am way hands off on VR chat because I don't even play VR chat. <laughs> um, my headset's the Oculus Quest now. And I, I don't think I'm not a fan of VR chat the now as opposed to it's fun. I like the idea of it. Um, but I, I think it's better for that one. Just let the community manage itself. I just take care of the reports. Uh, for the learn Japanese one, yeah, it's a bit more, uh, bit, a lot more time, but it's also five times the size. And then the other subreddits that technically I'm a moderator of, I'm like maybe the only user of it, so it's not really a moderation. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I guess for like the learn Japanese read, um, subreddit specifically, so you mentioned how mm-hmm. big it is and that it takes like a number of mods to handle. So is there a specific roles for each one of you? Is there a specific hierarchy or do you kind of just like play it by ear? You kind of just see the notification and then just take care of it. Yeah. So it's the idea is like if any of us handle a notification, then they've handled, then the notifications handled. So we're all the same there. Uh, we've got a discord channel. So we, can discuss there a bit more openly because it's a little easier than trying to discuss on Reddit. Um, yeah. There's one guy, he was really good about setting up, I guess the toolbox, the moderator toolbox, which turned out to be really good. Uh, Cause it does some stuff that the regular Reddit site can't handle wow. or refuses to handle. So that made things easier as well. So it's just reducing the amount of time a person needs to spend. Mm, I see doing it. That's really what you want to do. You don't want, cause again, this is all volunteer yeah. work mm-hmm. and it's for, f- I'm doing it for fun. Mm-hmm. In some Reddit comments before you said how, even though the time was there, you weren't actively studying Japanese. So would you say that you're more passionate about helping these online communities as opposed to just getting better at Japanese for yourself? Yeah, that's a big problem. Of mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, and, and I've been that way in many things, not just Japanese, mm-hmm. but the, I will say I'm trying to make a more active effort to get better in Japanese. So that's why I try to do these on YouTube. The, the, you know, I know I call it like let's learn Japanese, but it's more of a, they're now just all let's read Japanese. So that, if that's two hours a day of which I'm actively reading Japanese mm-hmm. and look at words, I don't know. So that's essentially two hours of study there. Mm-hmm. And really for me, it's just laziness. Mm-hmm. Like I should wake up in the morning, stretch and exercise before anything else. And I don't wake up in the morning, stretch and exercise. I instead plop my ass in front of a chair on a computer and then watch YouTube videos. So that's a, not good. Mm-hmm. That's, um, that's not motivation. That's dedication. So my dedication has been low or random, but when it's consistent, I do consistently get better. So 
that's also why I try to explain about don't look at a person like who's accomplished great uh, levels in Japanese. Doesn't mean that what they've done is reproducible to you. Right. But what I have done is because I started from scratch and I stopped and then I started back up again and then could notice what worked or what didn't work. Um, so I'm, I'm able to think, come up with a process that works for beginners. Definitely. It's not the only process, but I think it is a workable process with beginners. Mm -hmm. Right now, do you have a specific goal with your own Japanese? Like, for example, taking the JLPT? I, I, it's not a matter of passing JLP. It's having the ability to pass the JLPT, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, for, and for me, it's just, I know it's obvious, like, I've got way, 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 long, long way to go now. It's just um, my level's getting better. Like, because I'm reading, and I'm, I'm reading the audio, my listening's improved. And my readings improved and it's get better and better. Now my listening is weaker than my reading, but because it's fun and I'm enjoying it and I get a little mental high out of doing it, I want to get better mm -hmm. at it. And now I guess you have your own framework for learning Japanese, the let's learn Japanese framework. So I want to ask like, what's your goal for that specifically? Like, is it something you want to scale more and do more full time? Cause I know in the, you've also mentioned that you're not retired now as well. Since I think it's like, I want to put the number of hours to the, to the site that the patrons offer. So if it's like mm. $20 per hour. So if I'm getting 400 right now, it's at $400. So I want to put about 20, 220 hours toward the site. Mm. Now to the site means that, that right now that's the videos I'm doing. Yeah. So I'm doing tw more than 20 hours a month creating YouTube videos of the let's read Japanese. So that I'm already doing that, but let's say it gets higher. Let's say I get popular and people like when I, one of my goals is let me redo those videos I did way back then. I want to redo that Hiragana Katakana video because that's like 10 years old. And if you saw the video, it's, uh, in fact, there's one video, the audio just fucking sucks. But um, I want to redo all that, if that makes sense. Yeah. But I guess, um, I guess chronicling your entire journey to Japan, all the way from through the Marines, meeting your wife, and then going through your Japanese journey as your sort of passion along the way. So where you are today, you've gone through a lot of personal experiences, developed a lot of processes through your leadership experience in the Marines. So I guess going a step away from Japanese, is there any, I guess, personal advice you would give someone in terms of going towards their passion? Is there something you might give as advice to them? Write it down. Put some, don't tell, don't tell people about it. Just write it down about yourself. But keep it, keep it track. And what if you keep a track on a daily and a weekly? Because you look back, you'd be surprised at how far you get. Day by day, you don't notice a change. But when you compare like something here to last year and you can see the, the growth, then it's like, oh God, wow, that's a, you know, like hour by hour, I don't notice the, my benefits of the YouTube video. But I look at my, maybe a video from me two years ago as I cringe at like how bad I was, <laughs> for example. Uh -huh. So that means, hey, I don't want to be that bad again. Um, that could be the same with physical fitness, um, you know, but I think the reason why I'm saying write down, that's what Arnold Schwarzenegger said, you know, not only write down what you, what your goals are, like what are your goals for the day? You start out the day, write out the three things you want to accomplish mm -hmm. that day. Just write it down. And then also write out the three things you want to accomplish for the week or the month or even the year. And he even had a goal of the three things he's going to accomplish in the next five to 15 years type thing. And so that makes, that makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense. So yeah, track what you've done, but also have the goals of the on the daily and we in even on this calendar. I mean, I'm pointing out a calendar, but I might write down there like what is my my weight? Did I exercise that day? How many beers did I drink that day? You know, kind of, you know, if you want to track that. Um, another idea, if you do the calendar thing, like if you have a paper calendar or a desk calendar, you keep notes or information mm -hmm. before you throw that uh, that month away or flip it. Away, take a photo of it and just keep it on. Keep a tr keep it an archive of that, um, and then go back and look at it. Sometimes you might be surprised about what your mindset was way back when, mm -hmm. um, and uh, like how your progress has been. Like because, like I said, I I'm guilty of not doing this by the way, <laughs> and, uh, you know. But if it's small small stuff, write write it down, track it, and I think you'll find your your goals become much easier to be realized. Perfect. Well, I think this is a great spot to go and end the podcast here. I just really like to thank you for taking out your time of the day to come and talk to us at Korekara and really appreciate it. Um, closing off, I was wondering if you had any a specific message for the Korekara listeners um, at home. 
Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Did you mention that at the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, also make sure to check out Nuke Marine. We'll have all of his links in the description. But yeah, thanks again. Really appreciate you coming on. One last advice I give. Careful, don't do what I'm doing, which is spend a lot of time talking about learning Japanese. Instead, just concentrate on learning mm-hmm. Japanese. I think you do much better than whatever, whatever the hell I've done. Hey, guys, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. If you made it this far, go ahead and comment down who you want to see next on the podcast, and we'll try to get him. But thank you guys for listening. Feel free to join our Discord if you want to talk to us. Or you can support us on Patreon, but make sure to subscribe and like our video. Thanks so much. Peace.